Good morning here on the East Coast. Konbanwa uh, to all of you joining in Japan and konnichiwa to all of our friends joining from around the world. This is Asia Undercurrent, the fifth session. I'm Joshua Walker. I have the privilege of moderating and being the host today. I'm the president of Japan Society here in New York, but I'm excited to have an all-star panel for this uh, session today that's going to be talking about Kishida's Japan. In some ways, today's discussion couldn't be more timely. We have a new prime minister in Japan who's coming in at one of the most difficult moments when you think about the world and where we are. And we're gonna unpack that for you today uh, with experts both from Washington and Tokyo. They don't really need a full introduction. You can see their bios uh, in uh, the material for today, but very briefly, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Dr. Michael Green, who's a senior vice president for Asia and Japan chair at CSIS and also director of Asian studies at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. We also have Dr. Miria Solis, who's coming in from Brookings uh, as a director of the East Asian Center there. And also we have Noriyuki Shigata-san from uh, the cabinet office in Japan. I'm very excited, sorry, I should say, be very clear, the Cabinet Secretary for Public Affairs in the Prime Minister's Office of Japan. Uh, and he was hand-selected by the Prime Minister for this role. The last time he and I had a chance to see each other was in Boston, so I have to remember my different areas. It's great to see everyone today. Uh, I'm really excited for this conversation. And to kick it off, uh, let me just lay out what the themes are going to be. That way, uh, you, the audience, can make sure that you ask questions that we don't hit on, or if there are things that you want to know more about, we're going to give you an opportunity uh, in the last... Uh, a third of this discussion to jump in. But the order is going to be very simple. We're going to start with the broad uh, view of where Japan is in the world today, a view from Tokyo and what uh, the Kishida administration is hoping to do, having just recently arrived, thinking about this in the broader context of the security alliance with the United States and what this means geopolitically, and then focusing in on the economic implications, what the concepts of economic security look like. Obviously, there's been a lot going on uh, since the last time uh, we had this series, and even uh, in the last month. China has become uh, even more aggressive uh, than usual, whether it's on the concept of Taiwan, the idea of strategic ambiguity seems to be uh, uh, fluid, to put it mildly. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, particularly uh, uh, Mike's thoughts on that. Uh, and then also thinking about what the U.S.-Japan alliance that's about to celebrate its 70th anniversary of the alliance, but also thinking about what the future looks like, given the long history of these two important democracies. And then thinking about the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Quad Summit was the last uh, meeting that the former Prime Minister Suga had in Washington. It's one of the first meetings uh, that Kishida, uh, Prime Minister Kishida focused on and thinking about that constellation of these major democracies and the major players in Asia uh, from the United States, Japan, India, and Australia mean. And then thinking about things like human rights that have become a big discussion point as we look uh, to the Olympics in China. What are the discussions ongoing about things like uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership that now has taken on a more regional uh, perspective and the role of China, Taiwan, applying for membership, the UK. There's just a lot of discussion. And then finally, of course, you have the discussion about economic statecraft. What's the role uh, for a digital agenda, the data free flow with trust that Japan uh, launched the G20 it hosted a couple years ago. So we've got a full plate. Let's dive right in. Uh, you're able to submit questions. If you go to the very bottom of the link, there's a Q&A function there. If you put in your question there, we'd like to ask you to put your name and title so we know who's asking the question. And then I'll be going through those to make sure that I give the best questions to the best speakers. But for now, let's jump right into the discussion for today. Uh, we're going to start with thinking about uh, Japan's role in the world. And really, uh, obviously, COVID is on everyone's mind. Thinking about uh, every government's response to COVID uh, is particularly important. It's important to note that Prime Minister Kishida has come in uh, in an election and has a mandate from uh, the Japanese people, uh, but also that he's coming in in a difficult environment after a lot of other leaders have failed uh, in their COVID strategy. So his top priority seems to be focusing on the home front, figuring out how to deal with COVID. Japan has seemingly done much bet better uh, with the variant than other countries, particularly uh, looking at the, the rapid growth here in the United States. But for that point of view, let me turn uh, to Noriyuki Shikata-san uh, from Tokyo. And uh, Nori-san, what's the view from Japan? What can we expect uh, from Prime Minister Kishida uh, as your opening statement? Uh, good evening. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with a distinguished panelist. And uh, uh, let me just you know get started with uh, uh, overview of uh, Kishida administration at the outset. Uh, as was mentioned by Josh, uh, the ruling uh, LDP uh, led by Prime Minister Kishida won a majority in the general election in October. 
As uh, Prime Minister Kishida made it clear in his policy speech last week, he's ready to bear the heavy responsibility of steering the nation, having received a vote of uh, confidence from the public. Of course, you know, COVID-19 uh, related uh, measures uh, is a priority. Uh, and uh, he's also focusing on uh, economic measures uh, for the post uh, COVID-19 era. Uh, thanks to the accelerated pace of uh, inoculation in Japan, the rate of fully vaccinated persons uh, surpassed uh, 77% last week, uh, the highest level among the G7 countries. And Japan has been uh, has seen uh, a sharp decline in the number of new cases of uh, infection. So I guess uh, today's number uh, across Japan was uh, 175 new cases and uh, one death. And uh, uh, government will uh, support uh, those who are in need uh, uh, hit by the pandemic. And uh, uh, th there is appropriate uh, budget measures uh, that has been uh, introduced. And uh, uh, beyond you know, this uh, uh, emergency kind of budgetary measures, uh, Mr. Kishida is trying to tackle uh, the issues of realizing a new form of capitalism. Uh, and, and this is based on the idea that uh, uh, there, there's market failure, negative you know, effects such as expansion of disparities, income disparities or poverty or uh, climate change related issues. So he's uh, trying to correct you know, some of those uh, negative effects uh, and, uh, uh, and trying to realize a vigorous growth. And, and uh, so this is probably uh, the, the agenda items you know, that resonate uh, President Biden's you know, Build Back Better. And uh, this includes uh, the issues of sustainability and uh, aiming at uh, realizing a virtuous cycle of growth and distribution. So uh, this is something we, uh, Mr. Kishida will be tackling you know, during the uh, coming month. And uh, his uh, first overseas trip was COP26, uh, Glasgow. And uh, he uh, made clear you know, that Japan is committed you know, to uh, uh, the carbon neutral by 2050. And, and also he announced uh, his commitment for uh, Asia Energy Transition Initiative. And this is something where uh, there is a, a great potential uh, for Japan-US uh, cooperation uh, between Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden. And let me uh, just uh, lastly uh, touch upon the issue of economic statecraft. As you know, uh, Mr. Kishida appointed a minister in charge of economic statecraft or economic security, and uh, uh, he intends to uh, realize new legislation uh, during the next uh, uh, ordinary session of parliament uh, to address uh, the issues like uh, resilience of Japan supply chains or core infrastructure or issues uh, such as uh, semiconductor uh, uh, related issues. So uh, it's a full agenda, and uh, th this is a, a, another area for uh, Japan-U.S. cooperation. Uh, there, there is existing uh, Japan-U.S. core partnership uh, in place, competitiveness and resilience uh, partnership. So uh, between Prime Minister Kishida and uh, President Biden, uh, they, they could work on deepening uh, this uh, partnership. And very lastly, uh, Mr. Kishida has uh, announced uh, that uh, he intends to uh, draw up a new national security strategy, national defense program guidelines, and mid-term defense program uh, within the next uh, uh, a year. So it will probably take uh, roughly a year to complete this process, given a very rapidly changing security environment. And uh, very lastly, uh, Prime Minister Kishida attaches much, so much importance to nuclear disarmament, and uh, this is something he has been working really hard uh, as foreign minister. And uh, uh, I'm sure that you know he will be committed to work on on this uh, important agenda item. Thank you. Thank you so much.
uh, Nodi San, you've really laid the table and set the stage for a very robust conversation. Uh, Mike, let me come to you in DC. It's amazing the difference a year makes. Uh, American domestic politics has uh, been equally dynamic in many ways. Uh, a new president, a new set of agenda. We just saw uh, the Democracy Summit wrap up there in Washington. Um, what does this all mean for Japan's role in the world uh, and kind of Japan as America's most important ally, maybe not just in the Indo-Pacific, but in the world? And, and kind of what are you looking at in terms of Kishida's Japan as a new leader in Japan steps in uh, to, to strengthen uh, the, the kind of democratic alliances around the world? Well, um, thanks, thanks, Josh, and it's good to be on Asia Undercurrents again. Um, look, for uh, the Biden administration, but I'd say also Republicans in Congress, um, the key word they were looking for was continuity. Um, the Abe government and the Suga government um, were um, putting in place a foreign and national security policy that is not only critical for the U.S. as it deals with a rising and increasingly aggressive China and a, a, a North Korea armed with nuclear weapons, it's not only critical, but it's also the biggest influence on American strategy. Um, elements of the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific policy that they brag about, um, such as the free and open Indo-Pacific framework or the Quad were Abe Shinzo's proposals to Donald Trump. And as you'll recall, there was some question in Tokyo about whether the new Biden administration would continue them. They've not only continued them, they've, they've doubled down, they've increased, uh, they've moved the quad from a foreign minister's uh, gathering to a summit and added new agenda items, provision of vaccines, supply chain security. So continuity and predictability um, for Kishida is in some ways the most important thing Washington's looking for, and we'll see what happens in the upper house election, but so far, so far so good. Um, on the security front, though, um, as you noted, um, Kishida-san is going to have to tend to a lot of domestic issues because of the election in March. But there's a long list of very challenging foreign policy and security issues that will not wait um, until um, the summer, next summer or, 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 or next year. Um, the situation in the Taiwan Strait is growing more serious. Um, polls show that both Americans and Japanese are more willing to take risks to help Taiwan. But this is not just a matter of defense and contingency planning, it's a matter of diplomacy, of shoring up support for Taiwan to dissuade China from using force or pressure. Um, you mentioned the new um, defense plans in Japan. I think a key item the Biden administration will engage on is Japan's decision on strike weapons, you know, missiles that can hit enemy bases or ships from a long range. And uh, still sitting there unresolved is the uh, Japan-Korea relationship. And for Washington, moving forward uh, on a strategy vis-a-vis -vis both North Korea and China requires a strong U.S.-Japan-Korea trilateral relationship. We have an election in, in Seoul as well, and there are some early signs that the situation could improve, but that'll be important. Um, the Democracy Summit was, um, on the whole, a big success, but um, pretty difficult to decide who's a democracy, who's not a democracy. The, the good thing for Biden is that uh, of all the leaders in Asia, um, Prime Minister Kishida is the most interested in this agenda. He's appointed Gen Nakatani as a special uh, cabinet level uh, uh, advisor on human rights. And I hope that the Biden administration now takes its democracy agenda to Asia in partnership with Japan and others to give it more of an Asian flavor. That'll be important. Um, and um, the economic security issue, Mirie will talk more about this, I'm sure in detail, but there's a very strong national security dimension to US-Japan cooperation in the coming year. What technologies can we allow China to obtain? Uh, there's a consensus, I think, generally between METI and the White House about critical technologies related to um, AI, for example, semiconductor fabrication. But right now, the control of those technologies is quite ad hoc. It's quite ad hoc. And meanwhile, in the Congress, key legislation, the USICA, the CHIPS Act, that would involve massive investment by the U.S. in semiconductor fabrication are um, sitting in Congress. I think they'll pass next year, but when they do, how will Japan be involved? How will Japanese companies be involved? I think the White House wants them involved. So that's a big agenda. And, and Maria will talk about it, I'm sure, in an even broader context, but in national security terms, very important. And then the last one, which will be very interesting, is this is the time of uh, uh, the administration when 
The U.S. is uh, doing the nuclear posture view, uh, reviewing what our strategy is for nuclear weapons. And um, there's a big debate. Um, the Pentagon uh, uh, and uh, most national security experts, and for that matter, uh, defense and foreign ministries in Japan, don't want to make any changes to our nuclear uh, strategy because of the Chinese growing nuclear arsenal. Chinese strategic nuclear forces are quadrupling uh, over the next few years because of North Korea. But the progressive left, the arms control community, is saying we need to make two big changes. We need to have the U.S. announce that it will not use nuclear weapons first, no first use, and a few. And we need to get the U.S. to declare for the first time that nuclear weapons will only be used if we're attacked with nuclear weapons. That's a big problem for Asian security. Um, the so-called sole purpose would only use nuclear weapons for um, retaliation against nuclear weapons. If we adopt that in the U.S., it lowers the risk to North Korea of using its very large arsenal of chemical and biological weapons, since the previous strategy was to hold the North Koreans at risk with nuclear weapons if they use those universally um, abhorred uh, weapons, chemical and biological. And even no first use is a bit problematic because China has a no first use policy, but nobody believes that they mean it. So um, the national security community views this as kind of unilateral disarmament. The armaments disarmament community also views it as unilateral disarmament and likes that. Uh, Kishida-san's view on this will be very interesting. He comes from Hiroshima, as we heard from Shikata-san, he favors nuclear disarmament, but he's also a former foreign minister and strong on US-Japan alliance. And um, the nuclear posture review is now the most important voice outside of the US is Japan's. So the, Japan's a swing vote on the US nuclear posture review, and it'll be really interesting to see where um, Kishida-san comes out. I hope he comes out for continuity myself, but we'll see. Thanks, Josh. Oh, thank you. That's a great framework. And I want to come back to some of those really hot button issues. Obviously, being here in New York, right across from the UN, we're all very interested. I think what you ended on is something I want to pick up uh, in the next round. Uh, but before that, Midia san let me come to you uh, with kind of a opening thoughts about Japan's role under uh, the new Kishida administration. Obviously, COVID uh, has done a number on economies around the world. And, and while the global economy uh, is, is, is in different states uh, of disrepair as a result of this pandemic. Uh, the U.S., it seems, uh, is in a pretty good position. But what does this mean for Japan as, as Prime Minister Kishida thinks about a new form of capitalism and kind of an economic stimulus package as we've seen in the United States? What are you expecting uh, from Japan uh, as just an opening thoughts on the economic side of things, Midia? Um, thank you so much, Josh. And it's wonderful to be with um, all of you. And, um, you know, indeed, uh, we're going almost now reaching the second year of the pandemic and with a new variant. And I think we're all holding our breath to see what happens. And, uh, you know, the, the U.S. is, I would say, it's not doing uh, so great. We, we still have an enormous amount of uh, infections. A lot of people are dying every day. And, um, you know, uh, in Japan, I think that there's a lot of uh, interest as to uh, why the numbers are so low and what Japan is doing to, to uh, manage the virus. But the thrust of my uh, comments today, Josh, have to do more with the economic statecraft. And um, this is critical uh, to our age. I think that, as Mike was saying, there's greater fusion between economic and security uh, topics. And uh, it's an area for US-Japan cooperation, but it's also an area for uh, regional and global leadership. And I think that uh, getting these policies right is uh, critical. There's a lot of opportunity, but there's also a potential uh, challenge. So I would like to emphasize three main areas where I think that the Kishida administration will have its hands full and they're very consequential and they're important for the region and the United States. Uh, the first uh, topic I would say, it's really um, getting the balance right between economic connectivity and economic security. Because uh, we of course frequently talk about the very sharp deterioration in the security environment. And I think that Mike's comments address that. An aggressive uh, uh, China uh, threatening North Korea um, and uh, all these other uh, developments. Uh, but the same is true in the sense that there's a sharp deterioration in the external economic environment. If you think about a world trade organization that uh, is languishing, if you think about the greater um, 
uh, significance of China's market distorting uh, policies and acts of economic coercion. If we are uh, quite frank and uh, we recognize that there's an inward turn in US uh, trade policy, and of course the pandemic dis uh, disruption threatening the operation of supply chains. And one way to understand the rise of economic statecraft is precisely the need and desire to cope with these adverse trends. And I think that the first burst of activity came on the side of promoting economic connectivity. And that's when you see Japan uh, negotiating mega trade agreements, uh, really driving an infrastructure finance push to provide alternatives to the Belt and Road Initiative, and also to advocate for an open digital ecosystem with a data we trust initiative. But uh, uh, the international environment continues to shift and there is now risks uh, of this economic connectivity. And I think that we see now the second track of Japanese economic statecraft gain momentum. And that is what we refer to as economic uh, security, where we're talking about defensive measures to protect critical technology and infrastructure, to avoid disruption in supply chains, and to defend and acquire choke point uh, technologies. But there are trade-offs, and we should be very candid about them, in promoting uh, interdependence and hedging against the risks of this connectivity. And Prime Minister Kishida has put economic security in the front burner. There is the expectation that there will be an economic security bill uh, in the spring. And um, I think all eyes are going to be in Japan as to whether Japan can strike the balance right and what lessons can others learn. Will it be possible to protect technology while encouraging innovation? Can we tighten export controls without really undermining supply chains that have given us um, efficiency and raise uh, living standards? So that's, I think, one area where I'll certainly be watching very closely. The other one um, uh, important area in economic statecraft is that the US-Japan alliance is very robust, the economic partnership is very deep, but it needs to be updated and modernized to reflect the current uh, uh, context. And of course, the digital economy here looms very large. And the question is, can the allies really uh, build a digital pillar? And uh, uh, Noriyuki-san mentioned um, the core partnership. And it's very important, I think, to acknowledge that there is convergence of vision and interest between the United States and Japan. Uh, on the semiconductor industry, US firms have a lead on uh, chip design and advanced equipment. Japanese firms have a uh, lead in uh, advanced chemicals and some very important types of equipment. Both of countries are very concerned with the supply, uh, uh, with a um, crunch in automobile uh, chips and therefore they want to alleviate this, which is becoming uh, a drag on economic uh, growth. And I think that both allies are very concerned with the attempts of China to build a lead on semiconductors by using state protection and subsidization. But uh, um, implementing, operationalizing that shared vision has its challenges. And uh, you know, Mike also made reference to our desire to now have an industrial policy in the United States and put money towards uh, uh, building more advanced chips here. Um, METI has its own strategy. And there's also talk about then uh, uh, giving an action towards giving subsidies. So we, make, we need to make sure that uh, this competition to bring the uh, uh, FAFs from Taiwan and other places to each country does not result in a subsidy rate. So I think that that's important. We also need to join hands to negotiate a plurilateral digital trade agreement because we have a bilateral digital agreement between the United States and Japan, but the digital economy is global. And what is important is that we disseminate these standards uh, more broadly. And my last point uh, here on what is the important uh, set of issues on economic statecraft is uh, um, shaping the fate of the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. I think that um, Japan and TPP are, uh, have a long, very deep history. And if you think about the one uh, instance where Japan really leaped to the ranks of a major um, actor in trade diplomacy, it has to be the TPP. And I think the TPP will continue to play a very important role in defining the content, the direction of Japan's uh, leadership role. We know that the Biden administration does not at this moment have a desire to join the CPTPP. They're talking about a more vague Indo-Pacific economic framework. I'm happy to discuss that uh, further, but others are raising their hand and want in 
and that is uh, China, Taiwan. And it seems that uh, South Korea is now finally uh, taking steps towards uh, joining. Now, not all accession uh, bids are the same. And really it's China's um, uh, desire to join the CPTPP that's going to have the largest repercussions. I myself do not see anything that indicates that China is prepared to uh, surrender or moderate significantly its industrial policy, its mercantilist uh, uh, practices, its digital protectionism. So uh, the question is, do you lower the standards of the CPTPP to bring China in? or do you stand by those uh, disciplines? So really China's accession uh, bid is existential for the CPTPP. It can change the nature of the agreement. And therefore it's now for Japan, uh, time for Japan for, and others to show leadership in whether uh, they want to stand by the original project of the TPP and how you handle the relationship with China. It is a big, big undertaking and therefore economic statecraft is going to, I think, be a central to the Kishida administration, to U.S.-Japan relations, and to the direction of the regional order. So I'll stop here. Great, thank you. Again, I feel like we could have an entire seminar on each of the statements you guys have given, but let me do my best to pick up on some of those threads. Uh, let me come to you first, Mike, and actually pick up exactly where Miria left off. She talked about the need for Japanese leadership in the world today and kind of uh, really kind of taking a step up as a major power uh, with the, the now CPTPP. You were talking about the, the U.S.-Japan relationship and just how close and continuity there was from uh, both the Trump administration to Biden, which some people would be surprised by. But I think those of us watching closely on Japan policy in Asia more broadly, that is the name of the game. But of course, in Washington, as you know better than anyone, uh, personnel is policy. We have not had an ambassador ambassador in Japan for close to two years now, since then Ambassador Bill Haggerty, now Senator from Tennessee, uh, left. And we're waiting on Rahm Emanuel, obviously a very capable, very well-connected uh, mayor of, uh, of Chicago and, and chief of staff to the Obama administration. Uh, and also Nick Burns, who's a key player as, as the ambassador designate to China. And then, of course, you've got the czar of Indo-Pacific, uh, your good friend, our good friend, Kurt Campbell, uh, there. But in some ways, the question then becomes, you know, how does Washington balance those competing uh, interests of domestic, but also trying to figure out how to shape an environment in which U.S.-China competition is the name of the game. Uh, I know as uh, both a historian and someone who's actually literally written the book from the time of Commodore Perry to today, uh, Asia is the fulcrum on which now U.S. foreign policy is shifting. And so as we go into 2022, which is significant for many reasons, 50th anniversary of the return of Okinawa, uh, many different historical moments, 150 years since the Iwakura mission to the United States, how are you thinking about this moment in time in terms of U.S.-Japan relations? And is this really a turning point or is it just the way we look at history? We, we, we have a need as human beings to celebrate a new year. We're just looking at it through a certain prism. How do you think about this, given the broad scope of history you've had inside administrations and watching this space? Well, we definitely have a need to celebrate the new year <clears throat> and drink heavily after what we've been through this past year with COVID, that's for sure. But when I wrote my, my, my book by More Than Providence, which was a 240-year history of American strategic thought, one of the most striking things was that um, America will and always has organized itself to compete with hegemonic challengers in the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific. We always have. But man, are we clumsy and slow and clunky and um, and we're in the middle of that right now. And we have a lot of um, self-inflected wounds that are completely unnecessary. You mentioned one, which is that the partisanship in the Senate has blocked dozens and dozens of key ambassadorial and diplomatic posts. Um, I'm interested in Miria's view, but my view is that the politics of trade are not as difficult as people say. Um, the polls show broad support for trade. There's more American support for the idea that trade is good than ever. <clears throat> um, it's hard, but what it really requires is the president to decide it matters for national security reasons. All the previous trade agreements I was involved in, um, including the beginnings of TPP and before that, Singapore, Australia, Korea, the casting vote within the cabinet was the national security advisor. Um, who said, we need to do these trade agreements for national security reasons. And once it's a national security reason, the president does the heavy lifting. So um, I, don't, I think that's possible. And what's interesting is in this history I did, key allies, 
Australia, Britain in particular, had a huge role in helping America make that new strategic turn and focus on a new problem. And I'd argue, I have a new book coming out that argues this, that in the current um, turn, in the current shift uh, to the Indo-Pacific and focus on China, no ally has more influence, no ally is more important than Japan. <clears throat> um, and so um, Japan is, as I said, the the, the source of free and open Indo-Pacific, of the Quad. Um, but um, Japan's influence on American strategic thinking is limited, um, in my view, not by PR. I don't think PR is the big problem for Japan. I think the problem for Japan is it needs more friends to, um, to get the U.S. And Australia and Japan are largely aligned uh, in pushing the U.S. to do CPTPP engage in Asia and so forth. <laughs> um, Korea's not. Korea and Japan work at cross purposes in Washington more often than they work on the same agenda. And having been in the White House for five years in the Pentagon, if Japan and Korea came in with Australia, our three most important allies in Asia, and said, you need to do uh, digital trade, you need to increase your uh, shift of resources to Asia, that would be a much bigger impact than Japan's already considerable impact. So those of us who um, I think drive our Japanese friends and Korean friends crazy are not just doing this because they're both our friends, but because we know that Japan, Korea, Australia on the same side will convince the administration to do what people like me and you and Miri, I think we have to do in Asia <laughs> with our allies. So um, that's where I see the state of play, but no doubt about it. Um, in 2012, in surveys, um, most Americans said we should work with China, not Japan. Um, in 2019, after the Abe administration, two thirds of Americans, big change, two thirds of Americans said we should work with Japan, not China. So um, allies are popular um, and Japan should leverage that. Great, thank you. Uh, Nori-san, let me come to you and talk about uh, the overwhelming uh, agenda that you laid out in terms of uh, COVID, uh, climate, uh, and then a new uh, form of capitalism. That, that's a pretty impressive set of agenda, especially given uh, the domestic challenges. Uh, Mike mentioned the upcoming upper house elections, having just come out of the lower house and the LDP leadership race, you gotta be exhausted and you gotta figure out how can Japan uh, leverage its considerable weight in its region, but also it's kind of soft power. Um, how do you think about where uh, the historic US-Japan alliance and security fits within that broad agenda and, and ways that, uh, as Mike was suggesting, uh, Japan is hoping to work with the United States. Uh, you have a new uh, cast of characters, not just the prime minister himself, you have a new uh, foreign minister, uh, Hayashi uh, San, who just was at the G7 in London and gave us a great rendition of Imagine uh, on the John Lennon piano, but also you have continuity in the form of uh, defense Minister Kishi and many of the other cabinet ministers, how are you thinking about security and the broader agenda you laid out for us? Well, of course, uh, uh, foreign minister, as foreign minister, uh, Prime Minister Kishida was uh, working on strengthening uh, U.S. alliance uh, for nearly five years. So he'll be committed uh, to further deepening uh, U.S. alliance. And uh, uh, the, uh, of course, you know, our alliance is a linchpin of uh, Japan's diplomacy and security policy, as well as the foundation of uh, peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. So uh, Prime Minister Kishida will be eager to deepen our cooperation as related to FOIP, free and open Indo-Pacific, as well as uh, Quad. So uh, we have lots of uh, uh, agenda items to tackle. Uh, and as I mentioned, as the regional security environment is becoming increasingly severe with North Korea's nuclear and missile development and China's uh, attempt you know, to change the status quo unilaterally, uh, we are of the view you know, that the Japan-US alliance needs to be strengthened even further. So uh, there, there was some reference to uh, ROK. Uh, the relations uh, uh, between uh, Japan and the ROK is uh, unfortunately currently in a you know, pretty difficult you know, situation. And uh, we hope you know, we, we will be able to overcome you know, these challenges. Uh, as Foreign Minister, Prime Minister Kishida uh, negotiated uh, 2015 
uh, agreement uh, uh, between the two foreign ministers, uh, between Japan and ROK. So hopefully we'll be able to cooperate uh, among uh, Japan, US and ROK on issues like uh, uh, North Korean uh, security challenges more effectively. On the issues of uh, uh, trade, as uh, TPP was uh, mentioned a, a number of times, I, I wish to touch upon uh, the TPP. We, uh, we still you know, hope uh, that the, uh, the US uh, will uh, uh, rejoin the TPP. It, it is desirable that the US uh, will join the TPP, uh, both for the US economy and from a strategic point of uh, the US involvement uh, in the international order in the Indo-Pacific region. So uh, Japan has uh, constantly communicated you know, this uh, perspective uh, to the United States. Uh, and uh, we hope you know, that uh, there will be renewed discussion on these subjects uh, in US Congress and among US public, especially in light of uh, UK's uh, uh, application followed by China and Taiwan's application. Uh, as uh, Miriam mentioned, you know, we are also concerned about the uh, market distorting practices. Uh, in my previous capacity among G7 uh, trade ministers uh, uh, process, uh, we were discussing you know, this issue of uh, how we could, could address uh, China's uh, uh, the, the mark, you know, the market distorting practices. And, uh, uh, here again, you know, we have a renewed opportunity for collaboration between the United States and Japan, engaging with other uh, countries such as, you know, other OECD members. Uh, and uh, I should just, you know, add, you know, uh, the issue of uh, Taiwan's application. Uh, many of you have already realized uh, that the Japanese government expressed, uh, you know, uh, basically welcomes uh, the Taiwan's uh, submission of an application to CPTPP. And uh, uh, of course, you know, we, we will need to uh, determine whether ta Taiwan is prepared to comply uh, with the high standards. We do not intend to lower the standards of CPTPP. So uh, this is a pretty high bar uh, set, uh, especially for countries like China. Uh, we, we need to look into issues like government procurement, intellectual property rights, uh, state-owned enterprises, among others. And, and this, again, uh, we, we need the U.S. to come on board to address uh, these uh, China-related issues. So China problems need to be addressed both from a security viewpoint and economic view viewpoint. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Miria. I think you're set up very nicely to jump right into some of these broader issues. Uh, Mike kind of specifically asked about uh, the politics of trade in the United States. And as, uh, as Norisan just laid out, um, you know, TPP or the CPTPP has really shaped uh, the future in some ways about what the standards will look like. But there's also RCEP out there as well. It's kind of a parallel uh, Chinese-led uh, vision of what the world might look like from a trade point of view. How do you think about uh, the trade agenda uh, under, uh, you know, Kishida's Japan and also thinking more broadly about what the world, uh, you know, connecting the dots between economic realities and political realities, which sometimes don't align depending on what capital and democracies we're talking about? Thanks, Josh. Well, um, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say this, but quite frankly, I feel that the world is moving ahead without us. And by us, I mean the United States. And I think that's the main significance of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and to some extent, the uh, CPTPP. You know, in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, you have 15 countries that represent almost a third of world uh, GDP. And it's, you know, uh, ASEAN-centered, uh, and many of the way in which the agreement was negotiated really reflected ASEAN's preferences. But I feel that um, uh, even if China was not the original uh, you know, proponent of this, nevertheless, is one of the countries that's going to benefit the most of this uh, trade agreement. 
And um, not only in terms of economic gains, but in terms of really uh, pushing back against the narrative that uh, there's going to be decoupling from China. Quite the opposite. What RCEP will bring is a greater emphasis on the supply chain, uh, greater coupling with the uh, Chinese uh, economy. And um, that is, of course, um, very different from what the U.S. has in some ways uh, been uh, um, uh, working or, or telling the world might happen because of the risks that uh, China represents and its use of economic uh, coercion. Um, and then with respect to the uh, CPTPP, I think it was very uh, positive that the agreement did not die when the United States left because it does represent those very high standards and the door is open for the United States if the United States wanted to come back. Uh, but we don't get, get a sense that that's happening anytime soon. Um, you know, I wish um, that, that the politics of trade were easier. I find them harder, uh, if, if not very rational, because I, I agree with the point that might make that, of course, if you look at public opinion, um, for a long time, there have been uh, uh, strong pockets of support for open markets, for the acquisition of goods at a lower cost for the jobs that are better paid uh, that have to do with international uh, connections. And we know that in this day and age to become a network economy is really critical to remain a prosperous uh, economy. Uh, but then um, there are, uh, you know, the congressional trade politics, the congressional trade dynamics are very different from what people in the street might think about uh, trade. And uh, we've seen well, the Republican Party, which used to be a pro-trade party, really shift gears. And a large part of that party is no longer a party of free trade. And it's the head figure of the Republican Party, uh, former President Trump, who has made, I think, the most uh, um, harsh case against uh, international trade. So the, the, the dynamics are very different. And the Biden administration, in some ways, there's strong continuity with some of the approaches on trade from the Trump administration. They do want to repair alliances. They do not want to be destructive vis-a-vis -vis the World Trade Organization, but they um, are not seizing any uh, really uh, important trade initiative. On China, the, the tariffs are going to stay, and we don't have yet a sense of how they're going to try to really bring about uh, a change on its industrial policies, the state capitalism model, so continuity. And then vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific, we hear that next year there might be a comprehensive uh, economic framework. But the little that we know about it is that it'll comprise trade facilitation, uh, something on digital economy, supply chain resilience. But the, 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 the essential element is missing there. And that is that there is nothing about market access negotiations. That is at the heart of any trade agreement. That's when you actually become an engine of growth for the region and also um, tap on your own uh, uh, competitiveness to improve your own situation. So the Biden administration not speaking the language of the region, if you will, and they were at real risk of passing each other with an economic framework that might be looser in the sense of uh, um, not a very strong uh, structure, but certainly not dealing what is at central to economic integration, which is interlocking markets and becoming a more proactive presence in the region. Great, thank you. Uh, before I go to uh, Nodi-san uh, for some of his thoughts and then uh, back to Mike, uh, I wanna just remind the audience, I'm already getting a ton of questions, which is a good sign. That means that you are engaged and, and interested. I've got some great questions here. Um, I'm gonna go to those right after I go to these next uh, two, two, uh, two rounds, uh, two, two comments, uh, because I think that's always better. So please do go to the bottom. Do let us know who you are when you're asking the question so I can uh, make sure I give credit where credit is due uh, when you ask tough questions like I see in the, the, the chat right now, but it's in the Q&A function. Uh, uh, Nodi-san, let me have you pick up exactly uh, where media left off and, and kind of talk about um, Japan's leadership role in uh, kind of economic statecraft. You mentioned the new cabinet secretary. Uh, you mentioned the new ministry. Uh, you know, it's interesting to see the way that economic security has become a real um, 
buzzword in Tokyo and, and to think about the way that uh, the intersection of what we would have in the past thought about in some ways as kind of hard security or kind of military defense security and then the economic realms really being blended. And, and that means in, in a world in which U.S.-China competition shapes the geopolitical order, uh, there's a lot of uh, coordination that needs to be done from the private sector and some of the technologies. And, and Mike talked about what, what, what can we allow China to do in the AI space or whether it's the supply chain issues. How do we uh, merge those two so it's no longer just kind of uh, economic and kind of military security, but it's economic security. How does, where do you see Japan and particularly Prime Minister Kishida's uh, administration focusing your efforts on, uh, on leading in its region, especially if, as Midia just said, America might be taking a step back on the global trade agenda because of domestic politics. Uh, what does that mean for Japan in terms of its role in the region we're talking about today? Well, like, we are having a, a very intensive discussion of uh, economic statecraft or economic security uh, related matters. And uh, this is uh, due to social changes, you know, brought about by decentralization or discovery of uh, weaknesses in supply chains that were exposed by COVID-19. And uh, as you mentioned, the prolonged uh, US-China uh, uh, frictions. And uh, so we are uh, determined uh, to improve uh, our economic statecraft from uh, uh, three uh, perspectives. Number one is that uh, Japan needs strategic autonomy. And uh, we wish to ensure that strategic goods are available when needed. And, uh, uh, and we wish to strengthen the supply chain or enhancing reliability of uh, core infrastructure. And uh, this is something that could be realized through uh, international cooperation with allies or like-minded countries, uh, such as the, the United States. And number two is uh, uh, we wish to enhance Japan's presence in critical technologies, such as AI, quantum technology, uh, and the semiconductors. And uh, uh, this is, uh, what we call strategic indispensability, we are committed to free trade. So uh, we would be attentive to this uh, balancing between uh, free trade principles and uh, uh, economic security discussion. And uh, uh, I take uh, you know, Miriam's points uh, uh, very you know, heavily. And number three is uh, Japan needs to work uh, very closely uh, with the allies and like-minded uh, the partners to achieve the maintenance of international order based on free and, and open Indo-Pacific and, and, and basic values and, and rules. So uh, we would be uh, mindful uh, that you know, we should not uh, uh, lead to protectionism, but we wish to strengthen international economic cooperation based on common rules and standards. And just you know, a very brief comment on RCEP. As um, Miriam knows, uh, Japan has been uh, pursuing TPP, Japan EU EPA, followed by RCEP. And the uh, RCEP idea, ASEAN plus six, was proposed by Japan based on the Chinese proposal of uh, ASEAN plus three. Uh, over 10 years ago. So we were mindful uh, of uh, this, uh, you know, engaging the United States in, in the context of TPP. And this, this was our initial intent. Um, and uh, in the context of RCEP, this is going to be the first FTA uh, with China and ROK. And uh, uh, on, for example, intellectual property right issues, we could make use of RCEP. Uh, in, in terms of provisions related to intellectual property. So that, there is ways for us to make use of uh, mega uh, FTAs, especially RCEP, uh, in collaboration with countries like Australia and New Zealand. Thank you. Great. Mike, uh, to you to end uh, this round, and then we have some great questions just for the viewers. Uh, we're going to be going until 9, uh, 10, 9, 15. Uh, so we do have time. Please continue to send those questions. And Mike, picking up right off of this, uh, you talked about 
uh, the, the intersection and kind of the historical uh, legacy of the United States and Asia and always uh, kind of working with allies in shaping what what do you think this economic security agenda uh, means for Washington? What does it mean for the Biden administration with the build back better and the economic focus uh, that, that that administration has focused on? Of course, our own elections in the midterms upcoming that it feels like we've already started the cycle towards. How does this all intersect for, for the U.S., Japan, and particularly for a new leader in Japan as they think about uh, working with the United States, but also looking at other uh, regional allies that you mentioned, including Australia, Korea, uh, India and beyond? Well, the administration has been working on a, uh, uh, an Indo-Pacific strategy and Secretary of State Blinken's speech about what 36 hours ago was the preview. It didn't um, make news because it was all fairly conventional and predictable. Um, and what would have made news is if his speech had included something about economic statecraft and it's not in there yet. And it's not in there yet because there's a ferocious debate within the administration about what they can do. And not surprisingly, the national security community, the national security experts, particularly at State Department and NSC, basically all the Asia hands in all the agencies and ministries, um, recognize everything Miria just said about the self-inflicted wound of the U.S. being out of CPTPP, obviously out of RCEP. Um, and uh, they're pushing hard to get something in its place. Um, market opening right now is not is politically too hard, as Miria points out. Um, and so the focus is on standard setting, um, uh, export controls, regulatory issues, which are quite important, and especially in the digital space. Um, di digital is not a, uh, a an arena for traditional um, trade negotiations in the sense that market access is less of a concern than setting standards and controlling technology. So that's where the internationalists in the administration are focusing. And Secretary of Commerce Raimundo is leading the charge as a former governor of Rhode Island. She's quite a pragmatist, understands technology. If you've watched her speeches, she uses a lot of nouns. She uses words like digital and so forth, but she never uses any verbs. She never uses words like negotiate. <laughs> Uh, or anything like that. And that's because the administration won't let her because under U.S. trade law, the negotiating authority is with USTR, U.S. trade rep. But the USTR is now staffed by all the most protectionist staffers from the Congress and, and opposes uh, trade negotiations and opposes commerce or State Department doing trade negotiations. State and commerce say, well, these aren't traditional trade negotiations. They're about standards. So that debate is, is very uh, intense right now. I'd say there's a 50-50 chance that by the new year, there will be a consequential um, uh, trade strategy or, 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 or economic statecraft strategy, but it won't be the traditional market opening, um, uh, uh, important market opening process Maria describes. It's gonna be about working with a small group of countries really about technology. Japan will be right at the center with Korea, Taiwan and the Netherlands. Why? Because the most important issue right now is semiconductor fabrication and controlling that technology, where on an ad hoc basis, we're doing a lot. But I think um, uh, you'll see more momentum in that area probably. But um, uh, but Mary is right that trade, trade agreements as we traditionally did them are not in the near future. Economic statecraft and other forms could be, and that's the debate in Washington. Great, well, let me dive right in. I've got uh, two questions that basically focus on uh, the same region, Taiwan. I think there's a lot of interest in uh, Taiwan right now. Um, and the first one is more on the economic side. And I think it's probably more for Nodi-san and media san So I'm gonna throw that one out and then I'm gonna follow very quickly with a question specifically, I think for, for Mike in terms of the security uh, relationship. So the first one uh, comes from Andrew, who's the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan. Uh, and it says, how will a Kishida administration harness the CPTPP within the evolving free and open uh, Indo-Pacific FOIP architecture to include possible expansion uh, of, of CPTPP membership in the coming months or years. Uh, and I think that's that, that's area for both Nodisan and Midia. So uh, there's that question about the expansion of CPTPP, obviously uh, interest in, in Taiwan's application there, but more broadly, how, do you, how does Japan harness that and think about US Japan in a broader context? And then uh, for Mike, I think, and of course, Nodisan, feel free to jump on this one too, since you can uh, kind of give a Japanese perspective. Uh, this is from a, a good friend, Larry Greenwood, who's uh, out in Japan Society of Northern California 
California, and he focuses on what is the outlook for handling Taiwan in the coming year. Uh, the U.S. and Japan are strengthening their respective relationships while China is becoming increasingly bellicose. What's the likelihood of a miscalculation leading to a Chinese attempt to take the island by force? Um, so Nori-san, let me have you start with the CPTPP and then maybe a, a comment on uh, Japan's view on the security situation. Uh, and then uh, Midia, your thoughts, and then I'll go to Mike uh, to, to, for the Taiwan question here. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, in my previous capacity, I was working on uh, uh, Taiwan's application uh, to join the T uh, TPP-11. And of course, uh, Taiwan is an extremely important partner uh, to Japan as the two uh, share fundamental values and maintain very close economic ties. And uh, Japan was aware that uh, Taiwan had made public its efforts in preparation to apply to join the TPP-11. And, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the Japanese government welcomes its uh, recent submission of an application. Uh, they, ta Taiwan has been doing a kind of, so to speak, homework uh, to join TPP. And uh, uh, so, so this is uh, going to be uh, the, the process uh, to be examined you know, by TPP members. Uh, at this point of time, we are focused on the UK's accession. Uh, but uh, we'll be uh, discussing uh, Taiwan's application in due course. On the security questions, of course, uh, the peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait uh, is important, not only for Japan's national security, but also the stability of the international community. So uh, we, we have been consistent in its uh, position that Japan desires to see a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue through dialogue. We, we are stressing to the Chinese side that any attempt to unilaterally change the status quo will have serious consequences. So I, I stop here. Great, Midia san uh, on the CPTPP question, what are your thoughts? Thank you, uh, Josh. And just to follow up on uh, uh, noriyuki sans um, you know, I think it's um, a good thing that the UK was the first to apply because I think that that will let the members of the CPTPP work out the details of the process, warm up with a, a non-controversial uh, case, one where there's a strong uh, uh, um, uh, chances that this will work out uh, smoothly. So I think that that's uh, beneficial. Now, uh, of course, you know, geopolitics have landed you know, front and center on the CPTPP with the Chinese and the Taiwanese um, application. Um, and I think it's important that uh, uh, Japan and other countries um, you know, engage in that conversation with Taiwan to showcase how close to meeting the standards of the CPP, CPTPP Taiwan is. Um, the process is challenging because as we all know, this is a consensus uh, based process. So the disagreement of one is enough to um, uh, put a stop to the process and that's the same vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, China. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's important, uh, it's an opportunity uh, for uh, Taiwan to make the case as to why it belongs to the uh, CPTP community. It has a right to apply because, you know, it's open to any economy that wants to uh, match those standards. And I think, um, you know, the more uh, China sends uh, signals of disapproval about even entertaining the possibility of Taiwan uh, joining, um, that also showcases, you know, what having uh, China join the CPTPP could also mean for the further evolution of this trade agreement. So it's an, it, it brings clarity. It illuminates the process. It's not going to be easy, but I think that uh, it's an, impro an important process. Great. Mike, coming to you to the uh, very simple question of Taiwan and, and what happens, uh, you know, the likelihood of miscalculation and the Chinese attempt to take the island by force. Well, I think the um, the danger of a miscalculation or a Chinese um, uh, grab, maybe one of the small outlying islands or or cyber or other deliberate, not accidental, but deliberate um, bid to uh, coerce Taiwan. I think the possibility of that has tripled or quadrupled in the last two years, but it has crippled, tripled or quadrupled from you know a, an 0.5 percent chance to a 2% chance or something like that. 
it's still quite a low probability, but it is more dangerous. <clears throat> um, and um, a Chinese effort to coerce uh, or, or, or seize or neutralize or control Taiwan by force would do three uh, very bad things for the US and Japan. And people are increasingly realizing this. First, it would insert China into the middle of the first island chain. It would isolate and outflank Japan, cut off Australia. Geopolitically, it would be a, a monumental blow to the American alliance system in Asia. Second, the use of coercion or force against a robust and respected democracy would be an extremely bad uh, precedent. Uh, I would argue even worse than the Ukraine precedent because of the strong nature of um, democracy in Taiwan. And third, um, Taiwan, mainly with TSMC, produces about 90% of high-end semiconductors. China is 10 to 15 years behind the US and Japan and Korea and Taiwan in semiconductor fabrication, which is one of the key parts of dominating artificial intelligence and seizing somehow TSMC. Bombing TSMC wouldn't work, but coercing uh, would. So any of these three things would be quite bad for the US and Japan, which is why you have public opinion polls and prominent political leaders saying more clearly um, that we will support Taiwan. Uh, in my view, this is not a fundamental change in US policy. It's not a change in Japanese policy. Um, and by the same token, China hasn't really changed its policy. But what is changing is that Xi Jinping is clearly willing to use pressure, coercion, and force a lot more than his predecessors, at least going back to Deng Xiaoping. So it's a, it's a more significant challenge for us. The best thing we can do, we're doing actually, which is d defense planning, but also very importantly, diplomatic you know, when the when the G7 agreed on Taiwan to, to talk about Taiwan when Boris Johnson agreed, it wasn't Biden who convinced him. It was Suga. So Japan's voice in the international arena really helps shore up support for Taiwan. It's not that Europe will send military forces, but it says to China, if you do something coercive against Taiwan, you may face a really significant international backlash geopolitically and economically. We need to be sending that signal. And at the same time, reminding our friend Tsai Ing-wen in Taipei and her successor, don't make this more difficult for us. Keep on the steady course you're on. So it, this is one of the most important things that Kishida and, and Biden will have to get exactly right as we go forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me touch on, uh, it seems like there's a lot of questions, but I'm going to take uh, Duncan Bartlett's question, who's the editor of Asian Affairs magazine. He says, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Green, you touched on the U.S.-Japan ROK-Korea uh, trilateral alliance and mentioned the forthcoming election in Seoul. Um, how do the panelists see the current state of Japan and South Korea? It does strike me that of all the things that I've heard, this is the one that all of you seem to think is, is where there might be the most room for improvement. And a lot of this is out out of the hands of any one government, but something that everyone has to work together. There was the uh, the deputy secretary and vice minister meeting in Washington recently, uh, and it, it didn't go as well uh, because the Japanese and Koreans refused to, to go to the press conference because of the differences of opinion. Uh, Mike, you opened that can, so let me uh, turn it to you and maybe get uh, Nodi-san and Midia-san to at least uh, uh, give a response. I didn't want to end in that, but I wanted to make sure I uh, respected the, the viewers' wishes, which is there's a couple of questions. So I think broad... Uh, comments on on, on japan uh, south korea relations starting with you mike so so i i've been um pushing this rock uphill and then having it roll back down on top of me since i studied japanese and then korean in grad school um and in the pentagon i worked for kurt campbell in the late 90s and was my job was organizing the first u.s japan korea trilateral defense meeting of defense officials in 1998 we're only slightly stronger trilaterally than we were then. In some ways, we're in worse shape. Um, so it's very, very tough politically in both countries. And the US role has to be subtle. And we're not always good at that. There's some cause for hope. Um, Monday night, Washington time, Tuesday morning, Japan time, um, I was on a panel uh, discussion with the advisors, the foreign policy advisors to the two main Korean candidates. And, and, and I asked about this. And, and both advisors tried really hard to send a positive signal about what their candidate would do to repair relations with Japan. I think in Korea, the politics are shifting a bit, and there's a recognition that Korea's bad relationship with Japan is hurting. In Korea, um, poll, in polls in Korea now, Koreans distrust China as much as 
Japanese distrust China. And so that's, that's changing. In Japan, things haven't changed as much. And um, there's still a bit of a hangover or trauma from the, from the, the way that Seoul reversed earlier commitments um, uh, with Japan. Um, the Korean side's thinking about a big bang, like the Obuchi um, Kim Dae-jung summit, you know, big, huge, comprehensive settlement of all historic issues. In my own personal capacity, I've advised them not to do that. I don't think that's politically realistic. I think the best thing Tokyo and Seoul can do is change the atmosphere. Look for symbolic ways to show that we're all democracies, we're all concerned about China, we're all committed to a free and open Indo-Pacific. And I think with a new Korean administration, there's a chance you could start seeing Korea joining in parts of the Quad, joining in free and open New Pacific. And we should encourage step-by-step -step policy coordination, and but really transform the atmosphere as much as possible, which takes leadership. And um, I, I can tell you that I, I think the Biden administration with the new Korean government will, will look to Kishida-san and the Kante to do that. Um, it'll be a really important moment. And for the US, Japan and Korea, our poor trilateral relationship is in addition to trade, our biggest Achilles heel right now. Nori san, how about from your perspective? Well, as, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> Prime Minister Kishida, when he was foreign minister, uh, worked really hard to negotiate an agreement uh, between Japan and ROK uh, in 2015. And uh, uh, this is a, a matter of uh, uh, the trust issues, and uh, in order to restore uh, sound Japan ROK relations, uh, we have been urging the, the ROK side to take appropriate actions uh, based on its consistent position. So, so this is something uh, you know we we hope we will be will be able to overcome, and it, it would be great if uh, we could uh, work on uh, FOIP related issues, or as we have uh, been discussing, issues of uh, economic coercion uh, by China, as uh, Prime Minister Kishida mentioned in the context of uh, APEC leaders meeting. And uh, I hear that uh, uh, there, there is uh, uh, interest on the side of uh, ROK to uh, join uh, application, uh, to, to join uh, to CPTPP. I don't know whether uh, it's going to be realized, but uh, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, step by step, you know, we we wish to, you know, make progress. Uh, but uh, there is a fundamental uh, issue uh, uh, that I mentioned in terms of uh, 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 the the kind of honoring uh, bilateral agreements uh, between the two countries. Right, Media, is there anything you want to add to the the Japan uh, South Korea question? Uh, yes, thank you, Josh, and. You know, there is um, a lot to be pessimistic about when you talk about Japan-Korea uh, relations. And I, uh, I agree with the view that, um, you know, this hurts both countries' uh, uh, interests. And of course, it's a, a, a serious concern for uh, the U.S. in thinking about its uh, Asia strategy. Um, I'm glad to hear that there's a discussion among the uh, Korean uh, presidential candidates on a rethink on relations with Japan. And um, I think that, you know, if we want to look at some lights of hope, uh, the trade agenda could be one. I remember when I was, um, many years ago, I was getting started on uh, doing research on trade agreements. Japan and South Korea had a bilateral trade negotiation that went nowhere and generated a fair amount of acrimony. Uh, now, you know, they're both part of the RCEP. So I think that's that's an important step, not one that it's highlighted enough. And I do think that the CPTPP could become another opportunity to uh, try to have that, you know, turning point. Uh, I understand there are a number of bilateral issues that need to be addressed, but I think that maybe placing the, um, uh, the um, ROK Japan relation in this broader context and thinking about the economic integration aspect and thinking about how much they share in terms of, you know, their advanced tech democracies and their allies of the United States. And we should not lose sight of those fundamental points of convergence.
right? The organizers are reminding me we have a few minutes left and there's way too many questions. So I'm going to ask for a lightning round, which means means that you're going to try to uh, condense your answers as quick as possible. And then also kind of take whatever you want from the menu I'm going to throw out and then wrap up uh, with your kind of closing comment, if you can, in a minute or two. I'm going to come to uh, Norisan first. Uh, there are two questions I want to highlight. Uh, one from uh, Kevin Marr, uh, who's currently a senior advisor at M. Uh, the uh, consulting, but he's more importantly to many of us, a former director of the Office of Japan Affairs at the US State Department. And he's asking about the uh, defense capabilities in terms of enhancing Japan's defense capabilities to respond to the China threat. Uh, does the Kishida administration support more integration and networking of JSDF uh, with US forces, or does the administration support more indigenous capabilities? So uh, that might be a good one uh, to pick up on and kind of in there. And then the other one uh, is from Yuka Koshino, uh, uh, who Mike will be very familiar with having spent time in Washington uh, at CSIS and is currently at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And she wants to know about the capabilities and opportunities for the US and Japan to work together with European partners, kind of new regional actors to achieve the end goals of FOIP uh, that, that we talked about. So if you take those two questions, if each of the panelists can do a lightning round very quickly and wrap up in a minute or two, that would be very much appreciated. Let's start with uh, Nodi-san. I'll go to media and then I'll give the last word to Mike if that makes sense. So Nodi-san. Uh there is an ongoing discussion about the need for Japan uh, to uh, improve, uh, strengthen uh, Japan's uh, military capability, defense capability. And uh, in this context, you know, uh, as uh, there is a host nation support uh, uh, talks going on, uh, we'll be uh, discussing how we could uh, even, uh, you know, further improve uh, interoper interoperability between the uh, U.S. forces and Japanese self-defense forces. And uh, uh, I guess, you know, we, we are uh, starting to talk about, there is a report about 2 plus 2 and so forth. So I'm sure that under Kishida administration, there will be uh, efforts uh, to deepen uh, U.S. alliance. And, and uh, on the issues of European uh, partners, uh, we will be eager to uh, welcome uh, countries like U.K., France, Germany, uh, to come on board with uh, uh, Indo-Pacific engagement uh, under you know, free and open Indo-Pacific. And uh, we welcome uh, their initiatives in this area. Thank you. Great, thank you. Midia-san, over to you. Um, just a general comment. I think that you know, as a result of great power competition and the pandemic, uh, we see a trend of you know, the states are now front and center on so much of what we do, and therefore public expending and state action is central. And in Japan, this is reflected in the discussion about greater defense spending, but there's also a lot that needs to be invested towards the new capitalism policies and the building of critical infrastructure. And we see a similar debate here in the United States. So uh, there is a question of how much states can do and whether it can all be uh, financed. And I think that uh, another one to keep discussing and keeping an eye on. And the European angle, um, very welcome. I think that it is to everyone's interest to have diversification, again, in this day and age. Uh, and the more like-minded like -minded countries can cooperate and open the aperture on the number of issues where they're engaging, I think the more we can have what we're aiming for, and that is the sustainability of our rules-based uh, order. Great, thank you. Last but certainly not least, Mike Sensei. Definitely least. Um, so on Kevin's excellent question, at the same time that the public, the, the policymakers are doing things to integrate our strategies as allies, we think more alike on more issues than ever before. At the same time that's happening, um, there are two trends that um, are getting in the way of what we really need, which is more integration of our defense and technology base and capabilities. And the trend on the Japanese side that worries me is increasing um, rent seeking, koksanka, indigenous, you know, insistence on national systems. That is more expensive, less effective, takes longer. And on the US side, a continuing um, old way of thinking about technology transfer to a close ally like Japan. So both sides have obstacles to the kind of defense integration that would reinforce our integration of strategies right now. And, and it requires leadership from the top. And on Europe, you know, for 25 or so years now, uh, Chinese strategic uh, uh, writers, government officials, leaders have talked about the world being multipolar. There's a European pole, there's an American pole, and then there's a Chinese pole and a Russian pole. 
They don't talk about Japan as part of this. And they talk about Europe as a pole that China can pull away from the United States. <clears throat> part of our mission is to disabuse Beijing of that idea. And one of the ways to do it, in addition to US um, transatlantic ties being repaired, which is proving challenging for Biden, part of the way to do it is for Japan and Europe to strengthen their ties, to, to prevent this Chinese conceit that somehow the world is, is three or four big poles trying to manipulate. No, Japan, Australia, Korea are bonded by common democratic values with Europe. And every diplomatic or economic agreement that shows that um, slows down Chinese ambitions, in my view. You, the UK will play a particular leading role on issues of technology, defense capabilities, supply chain security, as the UK always have and increasingly will now with global Britain. And um, AUKUS is an example of that. Um, but we need a strategy that finds ways to pull along continental Europe as well. So what UK is doing in London is great. And, um, you know, from US perspective, Japan and Europe strengthening relations is a good thing. Um, the, when our democratic friends work together more, that's good. And frankly, because the U.S. is so confused on trade right now, it really shores up the system at a time when on that front, we're not performing very well. Great. Well, everyone has helped me do my main job, which was to keep us on time and on track. Uh, the last thing I, I want to do is, as I think about uh, all the conversations we just had, I mean, 2021 was the year of the ox and ox uh, are kind of about are about endurance and making it through. And as Mike already referenced, 2021 has been a tough and challenging year for all of us. Uh, but as we head into 2022, which is the year of the tiger, uh, it's about decisiveness and about boldness. And so we all hope uh, that the Kishida administration and also Kishida's Japan and Japan's role in the world will only be more enhanced. And I come away from this conversation, even on challenging discussions about Japan, Korea, or about Taiwan, US, China, more optimistic because I see so many possibilities that our expert speakers have laid out for us in terms of where we can look for the future. So I'll be continuing uh, to see what these amazing uh, individuals are doing in their own places, whether it's a uh, uh, Noriyuki-san and Shikata-san that will be uh, supporting uh, there in Tokyo uh, with the Kishida administration's agenda and hope to welcome uh, to Washington and New York soon. And of course, uh, Mike, uh, CSIS, Samiria Brookings. Uh, for you, the viewers, thank you for being here. If you get a chance, please go to the very bottom of your screen. You can send in a survey. You know that the Nikkei and uh, the government of Japan always uh, value your frank and, and open feedback. So please do that. It makes these uh, seminars better. Uh, there will be a sixth uh, installation, the, the, the sixth and final uh, for next year uh, to be determined. Uh, there's a lot to discuss. We've already laid a lot here. We could go on for hours, but I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you, uh, the viewers, and most importantly, thank you uh, to uh, Noriyuki Shikata from Tokyo, uh, Michael Green uh, from DC, Miria Solis from DC as well. Thank you, and I hope everyone has a great day or evening if you're joining us and it's time to go to bed uh nori -san. thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you very much